Well, I can't say I would have expected a sequel to Deep Trouble. While a pretty okay book for the series, there wasn't much in the way of hooks. The mermaids never became one of those marketable Goosebumps monsters. You never saw them on backpacks or bookmarks like you saw Slappy or the Monster Blood Hamster, in part because the mermaids never got any official book cover art. So Deep Trouble 2 is one of those sequels that follows the protagonists dealing with a new threat. And I honestly forgot everything about these characters. I mean, that was a whole 40 books ago. More than three years between publications. Still, I remember liking the first Deep Trouble okay. Actually, let me double check that old video. Yeah, I liked it okay. So hopefully this one will be okay too. So it's a year after the first book. Siblings Billy and Sheena Deep are once again spending the summer with their marine scientist uncle, Dr. Deep, on his boat slash mobile science lab. Thankfully, the kids love swimming, because that's all they can do. After some opening shenanigans involving Billy imagining himself fighting an octopus monster, and then trying to trick Sheena into thinking there's a shark in the water, an actual shark shows up. A massive thing, and clearly hungry, chasing the two kids back onto the boat. When they go tell Dr. Deep about it, he says that if there was a shark nearby, his sensors would have picked it up. But there is something... fishy going on. Eh? Eh? Sorry. Dr. Deep is studying some local ocean life and has picked up a dog-sized fish that looks sort of familiar, so they break out a book on fish species. We crowded around the book, staring at the photo. It showed a fish exactly like the one in the tank. Thin, silvery, but there was a huge difference. It's a minnow, Dr. D exclaimed. But that's impossible! I read the words out of the picture. Tropical minnow, one inch long. I glanced at the fish in the tank. It was more like four feet long. It's certainly a puzzle, and right away you're questioning, was that a shark or some other fish blown up to shark size? Dr. Deep has been collecting plankton and allows Billy to use some of it to feed his pets, two goldfish and a snail. We get a few standard Goosebumps scary pranks, and then the kids go swimming again, despite the shark, because there's literally nothing else to do. Someone please start a GoFundMe to get these kids some Game Boys. Well, things go bad pretty quickly as Sheena gets slurped up by a jellyfish the size of a car. Billy only manages to free her from its grasp when another giant jellyfish show up and the two fight over food or something. The kids return to the boat once again, only to find Dr. Deep being crushed by a giant snail. Billy's snail, in fact. It and the goldfish have grown so big they're tipping the boat over with their weight. The kids free Dr. Deep and work together to throw the goldfish overboard. But before they can deal with the snail and really figure out what the hell is going on, the boat is boarded by three shifty individuals. Mad scientist Dr. Ritter and his two henchmen. After some fake civility, Ritter reveals that he has been experimenting on this stretch of ocean, introducing his special plankton that makes the sea life grow to enormous size. The goal is to solve world hunger. But Dr. Deep rightly points out that all this will do is destroy the local ecosystem as larger animals require more food. The ocean will eat itself to death at this rate. Ritter is hearing none of it, and at spear gun point, forces the Deep family off their boat and onto Ritter's own science craft. Our protagonists get tied up while Ritter decides what to do with everyone. Billy manages to slip free, but the bad guys notice, and there's a tussle, spear guns drawn because you can't have a sea adventure with normal guns. It has to be either pirate muskets or spear guns. Thankfully, a few creatures throw themselves into the mix, giving the deeps a chance to run to the life rafts. Swooping low, two enormous birds. Seagulls. Seagulls as big as my golden lab back home. Their sharp cries were so shrill, they hurt my ears. The birds circled the boat. They cast huge shadows over us, their wings stretched out like sails. As I squinted up at them, they stopped circling and lowered their talons. Uh, seagulls don't have talons? They have webbed feet, like ducks. They don't grab their prey like an eagle. I suppose you could argue this is a mutation from Ritter's special plankton, but so far every single animal affected by it has just increased in size. I think Stein is just too much of a farm boy to know what a seagull is. I mean, a giant seagull would still be a threat, don't get me wrong. Birds have mouth made out of freaking bone, and normal sized seagulls can be proper bastards. Just, you know, they don't have talons. The deeps escape the ship on an inflatable life raft, just in time for a storm to roll in. 
They spend hours bailing the water out of the raft and are totally exhausted when they wash up on an island. It's small and uninhabited, but at least there's coconuts to eat and solid ground to stand on. That is, until a giant crab walks onto the beach and chases the deeps into the trees. If it feels like I'm racing through the story, trust me, the book is too. According to the Goosebumps wiki, Deep Trouble 2 is actually the shortest Goosebumps book ever, clocking in at around 16,000 words and just 113 pages. But despite that, there's a new twist, a new danger around every other page. And that kind of works for this book, but I'll get into that later. Eventually, the Deeps escape the island by tying their raft to now whale-sized dolphins and seeing where they take them. After slipping into some fog, they spot a boat in the distance and start to panic. Oh no, the dolphins led them directly to Dr. Ritter's boat. Wait, no, sorry, it's our boat. LOL, we're very stupid. The Deeps get back on board, but oh no, Ritter is there, waiting for them. You know, when I first read this book, my brain put a gun in Ritter's hand. But rereading it for this script, I now realize that Ritter doesn't actually have anything to threaten them with. No gun, not even a spear gun, no knife, his henchmen are missing, he really doesn't have anything. And yet, the Deeps slump their shoulders and admit defeat like this is just a game of hide and seek. So how is Ritter going to get rid of those pesky, pesky Deeps? By forcing them to drink the modified plankton. What do you think happens when a human eats the plankton? Billy, want to take a guess? Dr. Ritter asked. I took a stab at it. Um, they grow into giant people? Wrong, Dr. Ritter cried. He turned to my uncle. Dr. Deep, any guesses or have you already figured it out in your research? Just tell us what happens, Ritter, Dr. D snapped impatiently. All right, all right, I'll tell you. When a human eats the plankton, it turns into a fish. Okay, so this stuff makes sea life big, gives seagulls talons, and turns humans into fish. It's a real grab bag, ain't it? It also gives elephants thumbs and turns Dalmatians into VW Beetles. <laughs> Ritter forces Billy to drink one of the bottles of plankton that Dr. Deep collected. But nothing happens. Panicked, crazed, Ritter takes another bottle, drinks it himself, and goes full incredible Mr. Limpet anamorphing into a fish and flopping into the sea. The day is saved. I mean, the ocean's still full of giant fish that'll destroy everything. We're living through the origins of a kaiju universe, but at least the deeps aren't dead. So why didn't the plankton work on Billy? Well, it turns out that, in his prank war with Sheena, he planned to gross her out by replacing one of the plankton bottles with a bottle of iced tea and drink it in front of her. Plankton, iced tea, they look exactly alike. So when Ritter forced Billy to drink a bottle, Billy grabbed the iced tea bottle. Sheena laughs because she came up with the exact same prank too. Oh, the old plankton iced tea switcheroo. It's the oldest trick in the book. Everybody does it. Sheena grabs what she thinks is her bottle and downs it, but then goes, Oh, wait, that feels funny. Maybe that wasn't the right bottle. Oh, no, Sheena, it, it was the right bottle. Brisk is just like that sometimes. And so ends Deep Trouble 2. And like the first one, this was mostly okay, though for very different reasons. I wouldn't label this anything close to a horror story. There's danger and excitement, but not many scares. Instead, this book felt more like an adventure serial, like one of those goofy, episodic sci-fi pictures theaters used to run in the 30s and 40s. Giant monsters, mad scientists, square-jawed henchmen with spear guns, chases and captures and escapes. This has more in common with serials like Undersea Kingdom or The Phantom Creeps than any horror story. And that's really interesting because this is otherwise Arl Stein's usual style. Lots of chapter-ending cliffhangers and fakeouts. Except that works for something like this way more than it does for a horror story. It's hard to maintain any sense of tension when you're constantly releasing it. We've all rolled our eyes when watching a horror movie and there's a jump scare with a cat. Imagine if there was a cat jump scare every three minutes. That's what reading a Goosebumps book is like. But Avenger serials are all about running into the next threat, constantly jumping from frying pan to fire, a revolving door of danger and excitement. Something bad shows up, a giant jellyfish, a goon with a gun, a monster crab on a desert island. And once you've gotten all the excitement out of that, you toss it aside and move on to something else. 
Seriously, if R.L. Stein had aimed to make a children's adventure series instead of a children's horror series, I might think higher of his style. Now there's plenty to improve on here. There could be far better setups and payoffs. Almost nothing established comes back once the adventure serial is done with it, despite many opportunities for some clever returns. I kept expecting Billy's giant goldfish to come back. I mean, that's one of them on the cover, right? You could set up that Billy cares deeply for his pets and is sad that he had to get rid of them when they became giant. Then, while on the raft escaping Dr. Ritter, the shark from the beginning of the book starts circling them. Oh no, they're gonna get chomped! And then the two goldfish, now the size of dolphins, swim up and beat the shark up, protecting their boy! And where did the snail go? It was still on the boat when Ritter kidnapped the deeps, but when the deeps return, it's gone. Dr. Ritter committing fish aside is kind of an underwhelming defeat for your main baddie. He should at least accidentally ingest the stuff. So maybe Ritter's chasing the kids, trying to force them to drink his fish formula. He turns a corner, only to bounce off the shell of a giant snail. He falls back and the bottle of plankton breaks on his face. That's not great, but it's more satisfying than the antagonist just offing himself for no reason. And yeah, the plankton iced tea switcheroo doesn't really work. There's no hint of Billy pulling this prank, no real foreshadowing, it's a payoff without a setup. I don't know what I'd replace it with, maybe Billy just kicks Ritter in the balls and runs away, his classic ain't paying me to be clever. Yeah, there's plenty of spots here that could use adjustments and polishing, but at the very least I can say I wasn't bored or frustrated with this one. Does it go into the success pile? I'm not actually sure. The shift in genre really shows that Stein's rigid writing style betrays him in horror, and gives us a what-if scenario where Stein decided to rip off Commando Cody instead of the Twilight Zone. It's not a good Goosebumps book, it's a mediocre R.L. Stein from another dimension book. I give Deep Trouble 2 a door knocker out of 10.